20 years of Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. years of Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser is made possible by the Travelers, insurance and related financial services working to provide financial peace of mind for American business. By Enron, providing natural gas which holds the promise for a cleaner world and a more energy independent America, Enron Corp. and the Enron Foundation. And by Prudential Bank Securities, rock solid, market wise. Your host for Wall Street Week is Louis Rukeyser. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. It was 20 years ago, before Dan Quayle, before Federal Express and fax machines, before cable television or personal computers. It was precisely two decades ago that I hosted the first edition of what for millions of viewers would become a weekly staple. How long ago was November 20th, 1970? Well, it was a time when there was a vicious argument going on in the United Nations about whether red China should be admitted. It was a time when Americans were prohibited from owning gold. The Vietnam War was still raging, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average had yet to reach 1,000. The Beatles had broken up several months before, and I hadn't quit my day job. Good evening. I'm Louis Rukeyser. Tonight we're going to take a close look at the high cost of living. Most Americans call it their number one domestic problem. They are angry and confused. We're going to see if we can find out who is responsible and what you can do to help stop it. Well, we were all younger then. I was working as network television's first economic commentator for ABC News. After many years as a political and foreign correspondent for newspapers and TV all over the globe. And I was just moonlighting as host of this fledgling program until 1973, when I left ABC and went out on my own. We've had a regular Friday night date ever since. Unfortunately for true connoisseurs of ancient styles in hair and clothing, no one kept a videotape of our first program back in 1970, or of most of those in our first few seasons but we'll have plenty of giggles along the way for the sadistic during the next hour anyhow. During the first three years of the series, as it happens, we went off the air during the summers, and it wasn't until October 1973 that we went year-round. In fact, for the first 13 months of the program, we weren't even national. Until January 1972, we were seen only on stations of the Eastern Educational Network, a loose consortium of public broadcasting outlets that extended from the Canadian border to Washington, D.C. The program proved unexpectedly popular in a nation hungry for useful pocketbook information, and it wasn't long before we started attracting national attention and big-name guests. H. Ross Perot voiced a concern back in 1973 that could be echoed today. First thing we've got today is realize that the market is only liquid if the individual investor is in the market. Now then, a lot of people that used to think he's a nuisance would love to see him down there today. Uh, the big institution was very attractive. He's still attractive, but he must have a small investor, too. He's essential to provide liquidity in the market. Many in Wall Street would now belatedly say, Amen. We're light years technically ahead of where we were when we first went on the air. During one program in 1973, we lost our picture because a hunter shot out the video feed we were sending of a man who would become one of our favorite guests, Merrill Lynch's Bob Farrell, and America got only his audio. I've heard of people objecting to a picture on television, but this was ridiculous. And it was, we think, an accident. That sort of foible doesn't happen very much anymore, thankfully, because there have been a whole host of great moments that we wouldn't want to lose. Take that time in November 1975, when two of the world's leading economic figures men whose influence would grow even greater in the years ahead, 
were my guests in consecutive weeks. Paul, let's turn to the rest of the economy. You said earlier this year that you would be mightily concerned if the deficit in the federal budget went over $80 billion. According to Congress's reckoning this week, it's likely to top $72 billion. How concerned are you? Is this likely to destroy our recovery from the recession? Well, I think it's big. I, uh, I don't think it's going to destroy the recovery from the recession. The trouble with these deficits is uh, uh, not so much the size of the deficit today, when there's a lot of unutilized capacity in the economy. But are we on a course that carries this continuing along with these kinds of deficits as the economy does recover? And the economy is, uh, has begun to recover. It's been recovering rather vigorously for some months. And it's certainly time looking ahead to begin seeing reducing that deficit. And I would remain very disturbed if those deficits don't get reduced as, as we move ahead and as the economy moves ahead. We have to balance our social aims and desires against our investment uh, needs. The more you spend in the social area, the less you'll have to spend in investment. Investment means jobs, and you're going to have to watch your trade-off here. The more you go for one, the less you'll have in the other. And the only way you can make it up for your social aims is to have the government of the United States spend the money. And therein lies the problem. If the government decides to come into the capital markets in uh, a large way, there's less capital available for everyone else. If the government cuts back on its desires, there will be enough capital to go around. And not a word about Nancy Reagan and her astrologer. Over the years, we've done 956 programs with nearly 700 different guests, and no one could possibly count the number of predictions made here. Some of them have been amazingly accurate. Charlie, how serious is the energy crisis? Lou, it's large. It's going to be with us for a long time. It's going to be a fact of life which we have never experienced before, which is going to change our way of life and the future of our industrial society. Man, it's, our, it's my own personal belief uh, that you're going to have an acceleration in inflation. Uh, and I believe uh, that the uh, period of the 1970s will go down as the worst period of inflation that this country has ever had. Even in the 1970s, when investing in stocks was out of fashion, there were still some brave souls who correctly saw the great bull market of the 80s coming all along. Edson, some people incorrectly regard you as a bear because you were correctly pessimistic at certain key junctures, including 73. But in fact, you've just given us a pretty optimistic viewpoint. And I've heard you t talking about even higher figures for the ultimate future. Do you still see 3,000, 4,000, 5,000? Oh, yes, every generation uh, has its big bull market that blows off. We had it in the 20s, we had it in the 50s and early 60s. We'll get it in the 80s and 90s. You think that uh, in, in the 80s we will be twice or, or more where we are now, then? Or three times, four times? Three or four times. Uh, this will be the last century, the uh, last uh, decade in this century in which you can buy the Dow, Dow Jones below 1,000. The last decade. Well, how long do we have to wait for 2,100 on the Dow? I think... Uh, Within the next decade, we'll see that. As the 80s began, stocks still languished. But there were some courageous bulls who bought when others wouldn't. Last August, I had a comment about the Dow being at perhaps 1,700 by 1985. But uh, three years ago, I made a guess, this was strictly a guess, uh, that I thought the Dow in this decade might be uh, somewhere between 25 and 3,500. I am quite positive about the stock market over the next decade. And I see a stock market in historic perspective that is very, very undervalued in terms of fundamental things like book value and earnings. And to me, if we just return to a normal multiple in the next decade, which is 14 and a half times earnings, and have only 3% earnings growth, you'll see the Dow in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 3,000 10 years from today. How high are we going to go? <laughs> I would say there's a better than even chance that within six, seven, or eight years, we will see the Dow Jones Industrial Average sometime above 3,000. They laughed at Templeton's prediction then, but they aren't laughing now. In the fall of 1981, many of us chuckled at one of the most unusual guests we've ever had around here. But some of his seemingly wacky predictions turned out to be astoundingly on target. I'm a little confused. You said we're in a bear market, but earlier you said we were going to be in a bull market. When, when do we get out of this bear market and into that bull market? 
the end of the bear market, the earliest I can count it is about August 26, 1982. It might be a little later. W will we go lower than we've been between now and then? Probably. But uh, I'm not one of these 600 boys. I think uh, 750 to 770 is more like the range of the final low. August 26, 1982. Now, how do you pick the day like that? And can you tell me precisely what time Eastern I use about time? seven or eight methods. The count from the middle section, the standard time spans, which appeared in the Encyclopedia of Stock Market mm -hmm. Techniques. But usually, uh, picking the exact day of a low or a high is usually the, done by the count from the middle section. Your predictions are so specific and so long-range that I think the remarkable thing is not that you're sometimes wrong, but that you're ever right. I think it's <laughs> absolutely incredible. <laughs> Lindsay was right almost to the day. The bull market began on August 13, 1982, with the Dow at 776.92. Just after the bull market began, we had one of the most widely followed stock market strategists on the program, and he saw the long-range picture clearly. Barton, is this big summer rally for real? Yeah, I think so. Why? Well, I think it started from a level when stocks were as cheap as they've been at any time since the 1930s, and um, uh, the combination of that plus the combined in interest rates has given people some confidence that um, uh, the world is going to hold together and that uh, the decline in inflation is meaningful and that the 80s are going to be a decade of, um, of appreciation for long-term financial asset prices. Barton, you have been saying that for a long time. Why did the market suddenly agree? It finally saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> and there was other good counsel along the way. Is this a real bull market, or is it just a short run? It's been a bull market since 1974. I think that it is going to continue to be a bull market into the late 1980s. I think we are in a period that um, is similar to the 1949 to 1968 period, and it's a we will keep going until most stocks are overvalued, until... Stocks are really popular with and overowned by both the individual and the professional investor. How long do you think people should sit with stocks? Well, I think you can. It varies. There are some bull trends that last eight or ten years, and there are some bull trends that only last uh, a year or two. Right now, I think for the big stocks that joined the bull market in 1980, and I'm talking about the big blue chips that are in the Dow, I think that they are going to be the leadership stocks going into the late 1980s. The 80s were a great decade for stocks and bonds, as Barton Biggs and Bob Farrell predicted. But there was a frightening interruption during 1987. And the very Friday before Black Monday, one of our panelists saw it coming. 